Welcome to the SEI Podcast Series, a production of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. A transcript of today's podcast is posted on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts. Hi, my name is Andrew Hoover, and welcome to the SEI podcast series. I lead the Resilience Engineering team of the Software Engineering Institute's CERT division at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, I'd like to welcome Katie Stewart, also a senior engineer in the SEI CERT division. And today, we are here to talk about the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification, or more commonly known as the CMMC. Our discussion is going to focus on CMMC levels one through three and going beyond NIST 800-171. So let's start out by telling our guests a little bit about ourselves and our backgrounds and what brought us here to the SCI. Um, so like I said, I'm Andrew Hoover, and I've been at the SCI for eight years now, primarily working in the Cyber Risk and Resilience Directorate. Uh, my background is in cyber auditing and technical vulnerability assessments, and I've been able to continue that work uh, here at the SEI, performing and building assessments focused on cybersecurity architecture and measuring the resilience of specific systems and services. Katie? Hi, um, I'm Katie Stewart. I've also been with the SEI about seven years now, uh, primarily focused on cybersecurity risk and resilience, as well as measurement and analysis. Um, and like Andy, I'm one of the architects of the CMMC. Okay, so for members of our audience who are new to this topic, uh, we've done several blog posts and webcasts that provide an overview of the CMMC and our work on it. And we'll be sure to include uh, links to those in the transcript of the podcast today. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about the model. Uh, as most people probably know, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification, or CMMC, is a capability maturity model being developed and implemented for the Department of Defense that defines specific practices across five levels of maturity, while also measuring the degree to which those practices are institutionalized within an organization. The DOD will require a CMMC certification for all companies in the defense industrial base in order to be awarded a defense contract. Katie, do you want to tell us what's different about the approach that the CMMC brings compared with the way things are typically done today? Sure. So today, DIB companies that handle or are going to handle controlled unclassified information, or CUI, they're required to self-attest that they are meeting the requirements laid out in the Defense Federal Acquisition Rule Supplement, also known as DFARS, which requires compliance with NIST Special Publication 800-171. So when CMMC is fully implemented, DIB organizations will be assessed by a third-party organization against the CMMC requirements. This will include all of 800-171 like it does today, but it also includes at levels one through three an additional 20 practices as well as a process maturity component. So today we're actually going to talk through what those differences are. Okay, Katie, thanks for explaining those differences. Um, so earlier we brought up this concept of the CMMC measuring institutionalization. Can you explain that to us and tell us how institutionalization relates to process maturity? Sure. So if you look at the CMMC, there are five defined levels of process maturity. Today, I'm just gonna talk about levels one through three, but we'll link to the other material that we provided before that will go into more detail if you're interested in levels four and five. So let's start with a high level view of process maturity. So what is it? Process institutionalization is achieved through implementing practices that lead to process maturity. Process maturity represents an organization's commitment to and consistency in performing these processes. Measuring process maturity can determine how well an organization has defined, executed, and how they are managing their processes. So a higher level of process maturity will contribute to more stable processes. More stable processes produce consistent and expected results over time. 
In addition, and it's very important, more mature processes will be retained during times of stress. So this will enable organizations to both better prevent and in the event of a cyber attack, respond more quickly and easily. So within the CMMC, formal process maturity is assessed beginning at level two. A level two organization is expected to have documented practices that are guided by an established policy. The documented practices will ensure that the activities are repeatable and consistent. And the policy will represent the organization's commitment to the importance of the activities. At a level three, an organization is expected to manage and resource their activities according to a defined plan. So this plan ensures that the resources are available to carry out the objectives that were defined in the policy at level two. So with that, you'll have the policy and the practices and the plan, and they all should be in alignment. The level two and level three process maturity components within the model will apply across all of the technical practices being implemented within CMMC. So we believe this is actually a fundamental shift. As I talked about before, the current compliance focused approach relies on self attestation. So we should see a shift in organizational culture that will begin to appreciate and recognize the importance of cybersecurity within the DIB. Okay, so that's process maturity within the CMMC. Now let's take a deeper dive onto the other side of the model, which is the cybersecurity practices. Andy, can you give us a quick overview about how the practices are laid out? Yeah, so the CMMC currently defines 17 domains of technical capability, each with five levels of certification and a number of leveled practices. Most organizations, the DoD thinks probably around 80% will only need to achieve level one, which has 17 practices and demonstrates basic cyber hygiene. Before any organization can perform work with CUI or controlled unclassified information, they will need to have a CMMC level three certification. At level three, the certification requires achieving all 130 leveled practices um, you know, within levels one through three of the CMMC. Okay, so you said 130 level practices. We know that mm -hmm. NIST 800-171 has only 110 security re requirements. Can you tell us some additional information about the 20 that are included in CMMC? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So 20 additional practices were added in addition to those um, from 171 at levels two and three across nine of the 17 CMMC domains. Seven of these requirements were added to CMMC level two and 13 were added to CMMC level three. So in addition to protecting the confidentiality of CUI data, the DoD wanted a model that would change organizational behavior to be more security conscious, as you mentioned. The CMMC meets that objective by adding practices to those that are already included in 171 to ensure that an organization has a well-rounded security program, and then by institutionalizing all of these practices through the implementation of process maturity, which you already talked about, Katie. So the 20 Delta practices can be grouped into three buckets. Okay, the first bucket are fundamental practices that were added to the model to assist at DIB companies with progressing their cybersecurity capabilities. So these are fundamental, no additional cost practices that provide stepping stones of technical progression within the model. Uh, so there are six practices in this group, which include activities like reviewing audit logs or detecting and reporting events and defining procedures for the handling of CUI data. Again, very basic fundamental things that we do not anticipate increasing costs for DIB organizations um, above you know, what's required in the implementation of 800-171. All right, now the second bucket of practices provide increased situational awareness to proactively identify and mitigate risks. So this group includes six proactive activities. And these are things like performing root cause analysis as part of your incident management program, 
Um, there are a couple of risk management practices that we added uh, and a practice to uh, receive and respond to cyber threat intelligence. Okay, and then the third bucket um, of Delta practices provide what we're, what we're calling enhanced protection and sustainment against common threats to the DIB. These are things like phishing, ransomware, malware. Um, these are targeted, very high value practices that provide additional protections uh, above and beyond those that are already included in 171, as well as sustainment activities to help organizations recover from cyber events. So these practices, um, you know, include things that target phishing, like email forgery we added and spam protection, uh, performing backups and data recovery, as well as um, additional controls around managing non-vendor supported or end-of-life products. So let's close by talking about the resources that are out there and where they can be accessed. Uh, we've already mentioned a few. We have a couple of blog posts uh, that touch on different aspects of the model with a few more in draft, which will be published within the next few weeks. And we also have several webinars, fact sheets, and other resources that are available on the website. Yeah, and once again, thank you for listening to our podcast today. Uh, we'll link all those resources, as Andy mentioned. Um, free, feel free to reach out to Andy and me directly on LinkedIn, or you can email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. And this web this podcast is available at the SEI website, sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts, and anywhere else you might get podcasts, including iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. This episode is available where you download podcasts, including SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. It is also available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts and the SEI's YouTube channel. This copyrighted work is made available through the Software Engineering Institute, a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. For more information about the SEI and this work, please visit www.sei.cmu.edu. As always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you.